There were three ravens sat on a tree Down a down, hey down a down They were as black as they might be With a down One of them said to his mate Where shall we our breakfast take? With a down, dairy, 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 down, down. Hello and welcome to a special Advent 2023 edition of the Three Ravens podcast. My name's Eleanor Conlon and I'm raising my beta ready to thump out a rhythm, dancing to my own tune in much the same manner as my co-host Martin Vaux. <laughs> Oh, note the four hoes as it's day four. And in case you're wondering, yes, I will be keeping that up. As you'll know if you've been listening along, we're counting down to Christmas this year with 12 days of mini episodes, which will culminate in our Three Ravens Christmas special on Christmas Day itself. Oh, yeah. We're using the 12 Days of Christmas song as a framework around which to talk about interesting historical and folkloric tidbits loosely related to Yuletide. And much as you were a lady dancing a couple of days ago and a piper piping yesterday, you're also a drummer who drums, aren't you? Well, yes. I do from time to time like a little rattle of the pig skins <laughs> or goat skins when it comes to my moon drum. Dear listener, if you've never seen Eleanor's moon drum, it's absolutely enormous and does make a whacking great sound when you thump it, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. We should put some photos on the social media. Mm. We've got some good ones. But considering the sound, it's kind of amazing that our neighbours are still on speaking terms with us. <laughs> Luckily, our neighbours on both sides are musicians. Yes, they are. <laughs> Anyhow, to be clear, what we're talking about, unlike your terribly modern pipes and flutes from yesterday, yes. stay from a mere 60,000 years ago, <laughs> the drum is recognised as the oldest of all instruments. Pretty much ubiquitous with the arrival of humanity. Yeah, we touched briefly on this yesterday, but drumming is about the oldest evidence of music we have, isn't it? It is. Although the oldest drum ever found is actually only about 8,000 years ago because, well, how to offer a definition, a drum consists of at least one membrane stretched over a hollow shell or a frame. I see. Played by striking it with either the hand or a stick or a hammer. Mm. And the problem with drums from yesteryear is that the various membranes people used from them in the distant past tended to rot. Well, that makes sense. And out of interest, what is the drum skin made of on the 8,000-year-old drum? Oh, it's made of alligator skin. <laughs> and as listeners may know... I don't like alligators no. or crocodiles <laughs> or snakes. No. So, I mean, maybe the best thing is to skin them and turn them into drums. Although that also slightly revolts me. Yes. But uh, then we could bang on them all the time to make sure they're really dead and not going to come <laughs> after me. I mean, as much as the instrument, the drum, requires a skin, it's well observed in nature that lots of primates drum as a way of showing social dominance. I'm thinking of gorillas in particular. Yeah, gorillas, various types of monkeys and other animals drum too, including kangaroos with their paws. Oh, really? And rodents like rats. Also oh, drum. There's lots of creatures into drumming, which only makes sense because it's great. Yeah, OK, well, when you say it's great, I've been to parties where someone's cracked out the bongos and ruined the whole <laughs> shindig. There's a time and a place, especially when it comes to bongos. Very true. And while drums do have a very, very long established role in history when it comes to displays of dominance, mm. including in warfare... It's also worth saying that in many cultures, drums are a way of passing messages long distances Ooh. with particular rhythms beaten out and passed on by villages, tribes and communities, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, and for me, I think I most associate historical drumming with spiritual practices. You know, anyone even partway on the witchy spectrum has probably dabbled in the odd drum circle around a campfire. But in the ancient past, it's pretty widely agreed that drumming was part of ceremonies and dance and music making. You know, I'm talking here about Stone Age societies onwards. It's a fascinating area of archaeology, actually, not least when it comes to people in deep cave systems, really? where some of the oldest cave paintings in the world have been found. 
Experimental archaeologists have actually done quite a bit of work with drums as well as with pipes, singing and other kinds of percussion. Because, of course, caves echo. Oh, yeah. And a lot of the places where you find cave paintings, the way sounds reverberate in those spaces is quite unusual and dramatic. Well, that is super, super interesting. Although I have to say, when we've encountered drums in Three Ravens to date, things like drumming wells and so on, it's mostly been about raising alarm, hasn't it? Alarm and water. Warning. Interestingly, yes, it has. Of course, in social settings, drums are most commonly used to beat out rhythms. And we sort of expect music now to contain some form of percussion, certainly pop music. Yeah. But when it comes to the raising of alarm, which is a bit linked to social dominance, there is a long, long history of using drums in warfare. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of military history, I'll admit. Certainly not naval military history. <laughs> but I can imagine the sounds of booming drums being a terrifying feature of battlefield life. Well, well, it wasn't always so, apparently. Really? No. In European history, it seems from the evidence we have that the idea of the drums of war mm. only really came about in late antiquity. Really? So, at the earliest, about 250 AD. Ooh. And in English history, we didn't really get into using drums in warfare until the Crusades. Wow, that sounds really late to me, because the First Crusade was what, like 11th century? Yeah, from 1096 to 1099, mm. after which the Four Crusades states were established in the Holy Land. So we've got the Kingdom of Jerusalem, the County of Edessa, the Principality of Antioch and the County of Tripoli. And why did the English get into war drums then of all times? Because of the Byzantines. Oh, okay. And they were all about war drumming, having learned about it from the Turks. I see, okay. And because the Eastern Roman Empire was more or less leading the First Crusade, the English, French, Germans, Italian Normans, the Flemish, yeah. all sorts of people got stuck in saw the effects of war drums on battle and the trend kind of stuck. And I can see how it's useful for like keeping time in marching in particular, but I suppose it's also useful for battlefield communications as well. Well, it's interesting because at first it was a real problem. Oh, really? Well, horses that hadn't been around war drumming during the First Crusade were suddenly really scared oh, by no it. Way. And it was actually a tactic used by the Islamic forces, so beating big kettle drums to scare the Crusaders' horses. No. Yeah, so after the rest of Europe learned they really needed to use drums as part of their training, not least in their equestrian training. That's fascinating. But yeah, your point on sending messages is really important. Things like the military tattoo, drum rhythms to call for parley and all sorts of signals such as to advance, to retreat and so on were communicated through drum beats. Whoa. And the use of drums in warfare in England lasted right up until 1914 and the First World War. What? So all through the Napoleonic Wars, the various Africa campaigns, the Crimea, they were using drums in Crimea. Yeah, drummers drumming. Whoa. All of which was... Part of quite a dark tradition, actually, namely the drummer boy. Yeah, I mean, we're meant to be offering Advent cheer and all that, but drummer boys are something we probably ought to address, actually. Well, we have the obviously famous Christmas carol, The Little Drummer Boy. Mm. And it wasn't the case that military drummers were always young men or boys. Some were adults. But it was fairly common for military drummers to be boys and likewise fifers. Fifers. I'm guessing that is a type of piper? Yeah, they're the ones that sound a bit like piccolos, oh, very high yeah. pitched. You mm. see them in war movies from the period or episodes of Sharp and things like that. Yeah, yeah, I know the ones. Well, by the midpoint of the 19th century, almost every Western army employed drummer boys. Oh. And these children, many of whom were orphans drafted into armies, sort of served as mascots for their units. Oh, that's so messed up. And many of them died, of course. Mm. And a number of them became quite famous. Really? Celebrity drummer boys? Exactly that, yeah. Mm. So those were very much the days of mass-produced newspapers. Oh, yeah, of course. And so yeah. there was a seven-year-old boy called Nathan Futrell who was widely known to be the youngest drummer to serve in the American War of Independence. No. Yeah, seven, seven years old. What? There was a, another boy, a 12-year-old, called Charles Edwin King. He was the youngest soldier to die in the American Civil War. Oh. And there there's records of military drummer boys serving in all sorts of wars up through the Anglo-Zulu War, where the British decided to start replacing them with bugle players. Oh, God, it's pretty grim, isn't it? Like, when I think of the nine drummers drumming, I do imagine them in military dress. Are they dressed in red and blue by any chance? Weirdly, 
They actually are. Well, that actually likely comes from the Nutcracker, oh which is, of course, a very, very famous ballet by Tchaikovsky. Oh, my goodness. I've been imagining nine little Nutcracker dramas. Well, it only makes sense. After all, the whole deal with the Nutcracker, which is based on a short story by Hoffman, is that it's about this little Christmas Nutcracker toy below a Christmas tree who comes to life. But it's quite a dark story too, to be honest. I mean, Hoffman wrote freaky stories. Freud writes about him, including his story The Sandman, in his essay on the uncanny, which I am all about. Yeah, and there's um, an opera, uh, Tales of Hoffman, based, right. based on the stories too. Brilliant. But in The Nutcracker, of course, this child's toy leads a whole load of dolls and toy soldiers to war against the mice that live under the floorboards. Oh my God. And in the end, the little girl, Clara, who owns the toy Nutcracker, ends up marrying him and becoming a toy. It's pretty messed up. <laughs> yeah, and that happens in the ballet as well, doesn't it? It's the sort of final gift from the sugar plum fairy that the girl ends up flying off to Toyland in a sleigh as a princess married to the Nutcracker who was once a prince to live in a world of sweets. Yes, although <laughs> quite a few more modern productions have a bit of a bittersweet ending. Oh, do they? Where Clara wakes up um, as if the whole thing has been a dream and the, the Nutcracker Prince is the toy again. Aww. And she's sort of quietly devastated. Yeah, because in the original story, the Nutcracker Prince rocks up as an injured soldier who has fallen in love with her kind of by magic from, from the distance. Oh, that's so, really lovely. Yeah, it's quite I don't think I've read the original story. I've seen lots of versions of the ballet. Oh, it's dark. <laughs> it's dark. Well, we probably shouldn't interrogate it too much because <laughs> it's an all time Christmas favourite in America and much of the Western world. Yeah. So much so that in the late 20th century, it's said that about 40% of all ballet tickets sold were for productions of the Nutcracker. That's bonkers. Maybe, but it does explain your little drummer boy Nutcracker Association. And just to finish, on Little Drummer Boys. I'm pretty sure I've seen drummers in modern military parades. Are they still used in wars at all? No, it's purely ceremonial now, oh, okay. which uh, thankfully leaves the drum out of martial life, meaning we can just play drums for fun and spiritual or religious reasons to make art and music or from time to time to show dominance, as I am wont to do. <laughs> you most certainly are, and you're very good at it as well. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> and so, Martin... What are we going to be talking about next in our Three Ravens advent journey? Well, tomorrow it's going to be Eight Maids of Milkin, which you'll absolutely love. Yeah, along with <laughs> crocodiles, alligators and snakes. I'm going to say it, I don't like milk. No. So I'm glad you'll be the one writing about it. <laughs> <laughs> Until then, while our drummers have rat tat tatted off that way, we'll go this way. And remember, don't whistle until you're out of the woods. God sent every gentleman Such hounds, such hawks and such lean man With a down, derry, derry, derry down